The World Bank on Tuesday sounded the alarm on Nigeria, warning that further delay in removing the subsidy on petrol might render it impossible for federal and state governments to pay public sector salaries by next year. Lead economist, Nigeria Country Office of the World Bank, Marco Antonio Hernandez, painted a gloomy picture should the authorities decide to sustain the subsidy regime. The World Bank made the observation when it unveiled the Nigeria Development Update, a biannual report published by the bank. Similarly, the International Monetary Fund, in its Regional Economic Outlook on Sub-Saharan Africa 2021, which it released yesterday, highlighted the divergence and inequality at a global level between Sub-Saharan Africa and richer countries since the COVID-19 pandemic. To discuss the highlights of both reports and their recommendations, we're now been joined by Professor Indubisi Wokoma, an economist and director at the Center for Economic Policy Analysis and Research at the University of Lagos. Welcome to the show, Professor Wokoma, and good morning. Good morning. Thank you for having me. Well, good morning, Prof. Thank you for joining us. Uh, you know, thank you very much indeed. Thank well, you. Yes, we started this program this morning discussing a front page story uh, in this day newspaper, uh, which quoting uh, Fitch, the rating agency, says Nigeria will survive its challenges despite escalating grievances, says Fitch. Predicts 2.8% GDP growth for next year. Insists rising population, high unemployment, competition for diminishing resources, exacerbating uh, concerns. But the bigger part of the Fitch report is about how Politicking, political processes in 2022 uh, would most likely impact heavily on uh, government performance and you know whatever reforms that we may be looking at, either in the electricity sector or the oil and gas sector. Do you agree with this uh, uh, basic uh, uh, this core of the assessment by the future group solution? Uh, well, thank you very much for uh, inviting me once again. Uh, the the Fitch report, in my opinion, is uh, trying to, <clears throat> to tell us what uh, already is uh, in the public domain, what we already know about the, the state of the Nigerian economy and uh, the need for um, some proactive action by government to be able to um, address some key economic issues. Uh, there, there are lots of challenges, just like the report has highlighted, the issue of population, the issue of uh, resource, the issue of um, uh, even the issue of uh, budgeting, uh, the, the issue of uh, economic governance, uh, you know, uh, cutting across all sectors, and then the issue of security, and there, there, are, there are a myriad of problems, of issues that need to, that actually are working against the, the growth and development of Nigerian uh, society, not just the economy now. So I think, uh, by and large, one would say the, the report is uh, telling us what many, many people already know, or may, uh, experts in, uh, within the country already are aware that uh, there's need for a change in direction for the country to be able to, uh, to solve its, uh, its problem. So by, by and large, yes. Right. Thank you, sir. Um, what do you make of the growth projections in today's um, Fitch report that Dr. Abati just referred to at 2.8% GDP growth, whereas the IMF puts it at 2.7% GDP growth, which the federal government disagrees with, you know, tagging us somewhere around 3.5%. What are your thoughts on that? Uh, well, I, I even want to disagree with both the federal government and the IMF and the Fitch report. I, I wonder whether we can grow at even the... Uh, 2.7 percent, the way the economy is structured. Uh, the federal government is, uh, in my opinion, <coughs> overly optimistic. Uh, I think uh, government definitely will want to sing its or to to to, uh, to sing the tune the way it favors it. Um, if you take a look at the challenges that are confronted in the Nigerian economy, the issues of um, low level of production particularly uh, in industry, uh, high cost of uh, imported inputs, given the exchange rate situation, uh, low level of uh, basic sector production, agriculture, crop production, uh, low level of uh, uh, poor, poor state of uh, the operating environment, which, which affects even the SMEs to so be able to function. Um, lack of confidence in the system by many economic players, not only uh, within the economy, but even outside. 
So if we bring all this into, into play and take a look at the past two, two years, compare the, uh, the IMF projections federal government with what actually happened, the, 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 real, the actual figures, as well as the uh, projections for the period for the past two years, none of them has been able to meet the projection. So I don't think this year would be uh, any different. So uh, federal government says about, I think it's about 4.2% for next year in, in the budget. And then for this year's budget, the, what government uh, did project did not happen. So um, both the IMF, the, the World Bank, even the federal government, uh, in my opinion, the, the country is just recovering from, from the pandemic. And of course, we can see the GDP figures uh, becoming ballooning because of uh, the base effects. Um, so by and large, I think, in my opinion, maybe in the region of uh, the lower portion of 2%, I think uh, because all the figures here, they are optimistic. Even the oil market that is even driving our growth in some, some sense, is actually is going down slightly. The oil price was uh, about $80 per barrel uh, after about a week or two ago, but it's now in, uh, you know, above uh, about 78 or thereabout. So the, in that sector, there is volatility. Even oil production is not as high as uh, it's in the budget. It's about 1.4 uh, in barrels per day currently. Meanwhile, we have about 1.88 or so as uh, planned in the budget. So uh, if you take a look at the volume of production, the price of oil that is dwindling, and then the, the domestic sector, uh, domestic production, you discover that all these indicators actually are, are not being addressed. All the, all the challenges are not being addressed. And the, the level of poverty, people are getting more impoverished. So I, I am a little bit pessimistic, even though I, I hope I, I wouldn't want to be I, I, I don't think those figures have been put by the federal government, by IMF, by Fitch, may actually come true. I, 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 I pray I, I'll be proven wrong, maybe by this time next year. But from past two, three year figures, I think even 2.7, 2.8 could be on the high side, in my opinion. Right. So uh, I, I want you to, you know, interrogate some of the hypotheses we normally hear in the public space when we have economic arguments in the country for us. Number one will be Nigeria doesn't have a debt problem, but it has a revenue problem. That's one hypothesis they throw around. What's your take on that hypothesis? I, I appear not to agree with that. Everybody has a revenue problem. I, I have. I'm sure you have uh, a revenue problem. Everybody needs more money. America needs more money. So that shouldn't even be a problem in the sense. I think basically what government is looking at, it, they're looking at the tax to GDP ratio, which uh, in Nigeria is about 8% of GDP is a you know, tax revenue ratio. If you compare that to other African countries, it's, it's around uh, 15, 18%, 20% in some other countries where the, uh, so from that perspective, that argument is building. But I think the issue is like, even if we have more revenue coming in, and we don't know how to manage it, there'll be a problem. There's the issue of uh, cost of governance that we're not addressing. It's very critical. It has not been addressed at all by, by the authorities. We are buying new cars, we are spending <coughs> money, medical tourism, a lot of waste in government services. So when we talk about, you know, uh, that revenue is our problem, I, I, I think it's, it's a little bit uh, simplistic. If government is talking about that, what they need to do is to, to expand the tax net. There are many people in the informal sector that need to be brought in, and not to tax those who are already being taxed, tax them more. So the revenue problem issue, uh, the, the country, you know, in my opinion, is, is a little bit uh, too simplistic. So what government should be able to look at is the little money that we have, what have we been doing with it? The, all the money we've been borrowing, where, where have they been going? I think we need to interrogate those figures or those you know, uh, uh, government positions on what is being done with the level of revenue. And the issue of uh, debt, you mentioned debt. The, uh, sorry to say, I'm not comparing regimes now. I'm, I'm looking at uh, the economy. If by 2015, we had like a 12.5 trillion as our uh, public debt size. It's, it's, uh, it's now about 40, 40 trillion. So which is the debt stock has increased about three times. And then the price of oil now, the price of oil now is about 78. And that is about the price for part, for much of the last, uh, before you know, uh, this government came into power. It was only for the period of about three years, between about 2010 to 
2013 that we had the oil price going above $100 per barrel. So for much of the period, it's, it's been doing, it's up and down, it's, it's like a yo-yo. So when we talk about revenue being a challenge, even if we, the oil price becomes uh, $120 per barrel, as we are talking, as we, I, I think we need to look at other issues, not just saying that, that the revenue is our problem. Government should be able to see how, how we can make do with the, the little revenue we have and find a way to increase the tax, the tax net so that those who are not paying tax are paying. The informal sector, these are areas we can address, but let us not begin to harm all the time that the that, that revenue is our problem. That borrowing is our, Nigeria has a debt problem. I think we need to address that. We are borrowing and borrowing to a level that is not sustainable. And it's not just for now, even for the next generation, because we are leaving a very big burden for our, our children. And even for today, we have, how do we pay the debt even today? The debt service payment to revenue ratio is very high. Many people have been saying that. It's just like a, a broken record. It's uh, at times 70, 80%. So, and how do we pay the, how do we clear this debt stock? So I think uh, the argument that revenue is not our problem, uh, you know, it's our problem, uh, to me, it's, uh, it, it's trying to avoid going deeper into what the issues are. Revenue is a problem, but not as much as it's been orchestrated. What we need to do is that we have a debt problem, and we need to address it very critically, and frontally too. Well, Prof, I was shocked when you said that uh, even the uh, GDP growth rate of 2.8%, 2.7% is ambitious. Uh, what would be your own uh, projection? And, uh, the reason I said I was shocked is because, I mean, we, we have had many economists on this program who say that, in fact, what Nigeria needs is a double-digit GDP growth and that we shouldn't be celebrating whether it's 2.8 percent or 3.5 percent uh, that the federal government is looking at. What do you think that government needs to do uh, to be able to move, you know, GDP to a double-digit uh, ratio? And why do you say we may not even be able to make 2.7? And then quickly, your comment also on the proposed removal of first subsidy, either within the first quarter or the second quarter of next year. Yes, um, the, the reason why I'm a little bit uh, pessimistic is because of um, the challenges to production. They are enormous. There are lots of challenges to production in Nigeria. I think uh, sometime in the past we talked about the issue of the, uh, the issue of security. It's very critical, and government have been throwing money at security. We've been throwing money at it. It's not even addressing, you know, not just you know because you don't solve a problem by just throwing money at it. We've been able to <clears throat> to virtually exhaust our uh, you know uh, the, the, the crude account. Uh, we've been able to exhaust, spend so much. Even the next year's budget, government made so much provision for security. What government have been doing is throwing money at that. So I think uh, the environment for production is, is not in any way uh, good. It's not, it's not conducive for, for mass participation in that sector, in, in all sectors, a apart from services where people are uh, you know, resort to ICT. So in my opinion, government needs to address those challenges, those issues that affect production, address security, make the environment conducive. It's not just for Nigerians now. Even foreigners are pulling their monies out of the country. There's, there's, the level of capital importation is, is not improving. It's not improving significantly as would have been expected. So we need to address the issue that hinder production. It is when the, those are, are being addressed, that is when we cannot begin to dream. I, I want to ask us to take a look at what will happen at the end of the year, when the MBS will come up with the actual growth rate at the end of this year. Now, for the past quarter, we have had uh, about 6% growth in you know, quarter two, year on year. Now, the last one was 4% uh, for uh, year on year quarter three. These are because of the low base effects, because last year everybody was virtually on lockdown. We need to address those challenges that affect production. If we don't address that, and if you take a look at the past three years, at what rate have we been growing? Yes, we need to grow at double digit. I, I very much agree with that. But I think we are far from addressing the issue that, that, that hinder production. We need to take a look at, what, for each sector, what, how, how does the manufacturer get inputs? Foreign exchange is not good enough for him. He has to buy at 560 naira to a dollar. 
Can that enhance that sector? Take a look at agriculture, crop production. Can that, can that in any way, what is happening to the farmers? How many of them are producing? What is the, if you take a look at state-by-state state state GDP, what, are, what is the level of production for each state, for agriculture, for crops, or even for livestock, whatever? If you take a look at services, yes, we need to grow services. We are growing because of uh, ICT. So what are, we, what are those hindering factors that affect production? And once we address those ones, I think basically we can now begin to grow above 4 above 5%, even double digits, if actually we, uh, we, we work towards it. Then on the issue of uh, fuel subsidy, I think the, the country has a subsidy uh, trap. There's a trap. I will call it a trap. It's neither here nor there. there are, for this particular issue, there are more questions than answers. But you know, definitely there's a subsidy trap. And uh, that's a whole lot of discussion if you want to, to take a look at subsidies. Uh, because in my opinion, there's the message and there's the messenger. Very, very critical. There's the message and the messenger. The message actually, yes, everybody will want to buy the fact that uh, the country needs to address the issue of subsidy. Then there's the messenger. Because many of those who are pushing these arguments now were those who say there was no subsidy in the past. So that, that, that is in the, in the realm of politics. So this particular issue has a lot of them. It has social implications. It has the political implication. It also has the economic implications. So we may you know, look at them maybe together as one or look at the economic perspective. Subsidy is when you are buying a particular uh, item below the cost of production. Basically, something costs five naira, and you are buying it at three naira. Somebody is paying for the difference. That is a subsidy. That thing is subsidized by two naira. So the issue is, can we continue along that path? That is just the argument. And uh, people have said before in the past that there was no subsidy. I think that argument had, some people even say that uh, the price of fuel was uh, below 100 naira and all that. Per, per liter and all that. Now, the country needs to address the issue of subsidy. I very much agree totally, but there is there's a dilemma, there's a trap involved in all that. And I think we need to take a look at many variables. When government begins to claim that we have so, so much as the cost to, to eat for subsidy, we need to, 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 to interrogate the figures. What is the, the level of demand being projected? Is that real? Is that real? These are the issues. What was the level of demand per day? How many liters per day? Now we're talking about 60 million liters per day. Is that real? When the economy was booming, we were talking about 40 million barrels per day or 30. Now how can, with all the, uh, the challenges the economy is having, we are having an increasing volume in the level of demand being estimated by NMPC. As, so um, with that, we now begin to calculate uh, uh, the level of uh, the, the, the volume of subsidies based on the landing cost of uh, PMA because we are importing. All the refiners are not working. Oh, they, are, they are working on paper, but they are, not, they are producing nothing. So if you take a look at the issue, we need to interrogate so many factors. What is the basis? Government needs to come out clean and tell us how they were able to, co to compute this uh, volume of subsidy. And then we can now know whether it is worth it. Yes, I believe it should be removed gradually. That it, but it's, uh, there are, there's a lot to, 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 to I talk about on this issue. But government needs to address the issue. If government, as is being uh, noise about in the media, if government takes a step to do a one-off removal of subsidies, it could affect the foundation of the economy because of the inflationary effects. It could be tremendous. If you are selling fuel at 162 uh, liters, uh, an error per liter, and you want to jump to, to 300 and something, <coughs> the first swoop, I think the country will be looking for something that will be difficult to manage because there are, it has social implications. You have, you have labor, you have the political dimension, you have the economic, you have inflation, you have those on fixed wages. It has a lot of, so if government will need to address, tell, tell us actually what actually is the volume, the, the amount we're talking about in subsidy. Let us be sure how it is computed. And then we cannot know how we can handle them in phases. Unless we do that, I think it's, a, it's an issue that uh, may even complicate issues for the current administration. 
Well, thanks, sir, for that note of caution. As we start to round up, sir, what are your thoughts on tax reform? There's the VAT issue, which is subjudice, and then there's the World Bank recommendation about sin tax. Uh, tax reforms, like I said earlier, government it has been crying about uh, the revenue pro I think, uh, uh, problem. I think that is an area they need to look at. Um, there's need to, there are many people who are not paying tax. And some are paying, but not paying enough. These are the areas we need to, to talk about because uh, many countries, basically, the focus is on uh, domestic resource mobilization. That is one very core area to finance development. There's need for us to find out, many of these people who are private just how much tax are they paying? Some people are paying tax, they're not paying enough. Some are not paying at all. And I think these are the areas. They are, the, the informal sector is a very, very large sector. It is so, the government has to find a way, there's need for tax reform, find a way to bring those people in, into the tax net. Very, very critical. And unless we do that, we'll just be crying about revenue being a problem. We need to, to make sure the tax reforms is quite exhaustive. It takes into account uh, these issues about tax administration. And then the issue of the compliance cost. Somebody wants to pay, pay tax. Well, what is the cost of being compliant? What are the issues? What, well, how do we begin to, be, to deploy ICT to tax, to, uh, to tax uh, uh, administration and people to be able to pay tax? Let us be able to minimize the, the compliance cost when it comes to taxation. Okay. I think when we do that, we'll be able to move our revenue uh, from about 8% of, uh, of GDP to up to at least 12. We can start from 8 to 10 to 12% of GDP, and that will help us as a, as a country to move forward. I think the government needs to focus more now on tax administration, okay. tax reforms. Very, very critical so okay. that the money we need okay. can, can be realized. Okay, Prof. Another hypothesis. Infrastructural development will lead to increase in human capital development. That's the argument of the government, and that's why they're spending on infrastructure. But the infrastructural development is not affecting human capital development. What is happening? Uh, uh, we, uh, infrastructural development is not directly affecting human capital development. If we build the infrastructure, basically what we're doing is what, you know, trying to make the environment mm. uh, conducive for production. When you build, uh, you know, rail roads, you know, rail roads, uh, airport and all that, and uh, you are making, they are enablers. We are trying to enable the private sector to be able to operate. And definitely, there's no direct correlation, and even in the literature, that when you begin to invest in infrastructure, it directly impacts, it can impact on it indirectly. When you begin to, you know, transit through another sector to be able to enhance the growth of uh, human capital, government needs to actually invest in its people. That is basically what we have now as a country. We need to see how we can uh, direct a lot of money into the human capital. But my, my problem is not that uh, either or. It's not uh, which one should come first. I think my problem is about the deployment of our resources. There's a lot of, uh, in my opinion, misalignment of expenditures in the country. And a number of things that are not very, very important, actually, are where we are plowing in money. If you take a look at the capital expenditure vote for the federal government, it's like uh, vehicles that Prado, computers, and so on, uh, you know, think that are, they are capital, but they're not actually enabling them apart from the particular officer who is using the car or the private jet. So if you talk about social overhead capital, SOCs, yes, if we invest in that, it will make the environment conducive for production. And there will still be need for money to be able to invest in the social sectors, education and health. So I think the critical issue is not just uh, either or, but it's like we can carry both along if we're able to realign our expenditure profile so that there'll be a minimum waste. I think the war on corruption, in my opinion, uh, is doing well, but it can be better so that uh, a lot of leakages will actually be plugged and the country can, move, can make more progress. Well, thank you very much, uh, Professor Ndombezi Nwokoma, for joining us this morning on The Morning Show. Thank you very much indeed.